Hi folks and welcome to another screencast in my series of lectures on the cell. Today we're going to look at a very important part of any cell and that's the cell's membrane, otherwise known as the plasma membrane. When you first learned about the cell membrane in grade school, you were probably taught that it's simply an organelle that holds the cytoplasm in the cell. And that was it. But now you're ready to learn that it's a lot more than just a boundary for the cell. It regulates or controls the passage of all materials into and out of the cell. This is an incredibly important function. First, let's take a look at the molecular structure of the membrane, and then I'll tell you how its structure allows it to do the important job it has. If we could see the membrane, the first thing I'd point out to you is that it's just two layers of molecules thick. In fact, it's described as a bilayer of a lipid compound called a phospholipid. Phospholipids are a type of lipid that has two fatty acid tails with a phosphate head. As you know, lipids are nonpolar and they're hydrophobic, meaning this end of the molecule repels water. This is interesting because both the interior and exterior environment of a cell are a watery or aqueous environment. The phosphate head is polar and hydrophilic. It's attracted to water. When put into a watery environment, these molecules assemble in such a way that the phosphate heads face the aqueous internal and external environments of the cell. Water is kept out of the layer in between. This is a good thing because water would otherwise dissolve the membrane of the cell. Imagine jumping into a pool for a swim and eventually dissolving into a ring of cell material around the edge of the pool. What a mess. So here you see the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane. Other compounds are found here too. These interesting little things are cholesterol molecules. They're supposed to be there. They help give the membrane flexibility. Because the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic, the membrane is impermeable to water or any other polar or electrically charged particle. This is partly why it's considered selectively permeable. If the cell needs to move a substance through that is polar or electrically charged, well then it has to use channel proteins that allow this to happen. We'll discuss cellular transport at another time. But that's not the only stuff that's found in, this, in a typical cell membrane. This model here shows proteins embedded in the membrane. Some are called peripheral proteins and don't go all the way through the double layer. Those aren't shown in this picture. I'll show them to you in another. Others do go all the way through to the other side and are called integral proteins. As we've learned, proteins are very important compounds. Of the many functions of proteins, they act as anchoring points for the cell's cytoplasm. They help cells move if they have to. They help connect the cell to its neighbor, and in this case we have a name for them. They're called desmosomes. Some act as channels to allow plasma exchange. In animal cells, we call these gap junctions. In plant cells, because they have to go through a cell wall, we call them plasmodesmata. Others are simply channel proteins to allow those polar or ionically charged particles to go through. Others act as protein pumps that must use energy in order to get material through the membrane. Still more for receptors of the cell in cell-to-cell -cell communication. Some act as enzymes and some are glycoproteins. These are proteins that have carbohydrates attached on their surface and these act as the cell's identification. For your cells, these, these are the proteins that your immune system would recognize as yours. If your immune system detects a foreign protein, well, it destroys it. This is why organ transplant and blood transfusions can fail. The next series of images show models of these proteins and actions. This is a typical model of a channel protein allowing materials that are polar, perhaps water, to come on through. This would, this would represent a protein pump actively pumping materials across the membrane from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Some act as enzymes. We know the model of enzymes. They act to speed up chemical reactions. Here's a signaling protein. Some chemical from the outside would be received by protein receptor 
and cause a change on the inside of the cell. Here's a glycoprotein. The protein structure is embedded and the carbohydrate is on the surface, allowing some other protein to attach to it for identification. Here's an anchoring protein, those desmosomes that I mentioned. And here's yet other anchoring proteins for the cytoskeleton or extracellular anchorage. Altogether, the membrane is very dynamic. The molecules in it move about fluidly, changing their positions. This model of the membrane is known as the fluid mosaic model because the membrane is fluid. The molecules in it move about fluidly changing their positions as they perform their functions. All life depends on the proper functioning of this thin veil of material, a supple membrane, just two molecules thick. Now the membrane grows as the cell grows and it's made from the endomembrane system, that is, the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER, and the Golgi body, as they assemble vesicles with the proper proteins that make their way to the cell surface and become part of it. Well, that's enough for this topic. We'll certainly discuss more in class. If you've got any questions or comments, please write them down and bring them to class so we can discuss them. Until then, be well.